Robinson and I'm really pleased to be speaking with you today. I've lived with Martin Carter's words for now nearly 30 years and I'm joining you today from Scotland. I'm mentioning this partly because as we turn our attention to Carter's sequence of poems, Conversations, I want to note how his poetry reaches out to readers, crossing borders, real and imagined, and creates connections for us, creates conversations for us across place and time. Poetry by Martin Carter, I think, is a poetry of involvement. It's a poetry that is attuned to how we share the world with others, and the idea of conversation and connection is very powerful in this context. As we focus on Carter's interest in conversation, I think we should also remember that exactly 70 years ago today, Martin Carter was being held indefinitely at Atkinson Field in 1953. Christmas was coming, he was 26, married to Phyllis and with a young baby Keith. Public meetings had been banned and Carter's work had been seized. Yusei Koyana remembers that the detainees were confined for 24 hours a day, not allowed to go outdoors. But they also had each other, they shared conversations, and Rory Westmass remembers Martin Carter sharing poems that he had written. And Carter's poems kept reaching out, kept making connections, kept having the conversations on the page that he wasn't able to have in real life, in person. So in letter two, he asks about his family. He says, tell me, the young one, is he creeping now? And to his wife, he writes, I send a kiss to tell you everything about today, the 20th in the distance. In Carter's work, there are many times when he uses the vocabulary of communication. Across the full stretch of his work, we'll find words like voices, speaking, telling, crying, declarations, muttering, utterance, praise and talk. The word conversation is a little bit different. When these seven untitled poems that make up conversation were first published in 1961 in Kaikoveral, it was the first time that he'd used this word in his poetry. And then more strikingly, the word isn't used in any of the poems at all. Over time, we can see that this is actually one of Carter's titling techniques. The word resistance doesn't appear in poems of resistance. The word succession doesn't appear in poems of succession. And there are no instances of affinity in poems of affinity. But we know that conversation was essential to Carter. UC Quayana remembers that after PPP executive meetings in the 1950s, he and Carter would continue their conversations. They would cycle to Le Souvenir together, talking the whole way. And then Carter would turn around and cycle back to Georgetown and UC Cryana would carry on to Buxton. Rory Westmass said that Carter didn't mind fighting an unwinnable seat in 1953 because what he mainly wanted to do was talk with people. The Carter house in Anira Street was well known as a place to come for conversation. Janet Jagan told me that her prison experience was strikingly different, she thought, from the men in the PPP, because she noted that unlike her prison experience, what they were able to do was to continue talking as comrades while they were imprisoned. Outside of the PPP experience, Wilson Harris and Sidney Singh rented a room in Hadfield Street and Carter and others would go there to talk. In a notebook, the writer A.J. Seymour, the poet and the editor of Kai Koveral, that these poems from um, these conversation poems appear in, he wrote himself a short note, just three words, Ring, Martin, Dash, Hegel. We can also get a feel for Carter's interests in conversation by looking at his open letter published just a few years after the conversations poems. This appeared in New World Fortnightly in 1964. And these are challenging, searching words for his contemporaries. He wrote, The almost fanatical preoccupation with hollow issues, the gossip mongering which passes for conversation, and the inevitable political hysteria leave little time for the serious examination of ideas. I know that the psychological squalor of everyday life is exhausting. I know that the urgent practical problem of making a living comes first. What I do not know is why only so few revolt, either by word or by deed, 
against such spirit, acute spiritual discomfort. So conversation is never hollow talk for Carter. It is the serious examination of ideas and a route out of spiritual and material discomfort. And that's, I think, why it's so powerful and so painful to read the opening lines of Carter's poem for Walter Rodney. He writes in that, assassins of conversation, they bury the voice. The etymology of conversation is instructive for us, I think. To converse can mean in its Latin form, to turn together or to turn over in the mind. In medieval French, it means to live together. And later in more modern versions of um, English, it becomes talking together. So to kill conversation is not just to destroy speech. It destroys our ways of living together. It destroys our ways of thinking. A gap of six years separated conversations from Carter's last sequence of poems, poems of shape and motion. He had published individual poems in those intervening years, but this was the first group. And in the pages of Kaikoveral, the poems are laid out in a two page spread in italics without titles. And each poem is separated by the icon of a star. Following Carter's now conventional approach, they appeared without any comment from him as author. A.J. Seymour added very little in his editorial, describing the creative work as, quote, viewpoints on the contemporary scene. Later, Carter would cut the second and the fifth poems and give titles to the remaining ones when they were appeared in poems of succession. Between poems of shape and motion and conversations, Carter had left the PPP, worked as a teacher, become an information officer in the British Council's Georgetown office, and then joined Booker as an information officer. If these jobs seemed like they were taking Carter towards communications and away from the craft of poetry, conversations, this sequence of poetry, proved that poetry and the uses and limits of poems were always on his mind. The first poem in Conversations tackles directly the craft of poetry, and here Carter questions the poet's duty to write for a particular readership. They say I'm a poet, write for them. Sometimes I laugh, sometimes I solemnly nod. A poet cannot write for those who ask, hardly himself even, except he lies. Conversations here becomes a series of demands, evasions and refusals. By reporting but not quoting any of the dialogues, the actual conversations become less important than thinking about what the role of the poet is. Carter's lines are sparse but not quite prose, and as with so many of his poems, the form is a lyric, centering the I of the poet. But these are lyrics in pursuit of collective feeling, not private personal feeling. There is a defining imperative at the start to write for them, but the poet does not want to compose poems on demand. However, having denied this possibility, Carter also focuses on the idea of the audience. Poems are written either for the dying or the unborn, no matter what they say. It's a serious vision of the role for the poet in a society. And Carter's almost theological as he seems to focus on people who are at those temporal boundaries of society, looking at those about to leave the community or those not yet born into it. But in the final lines, he claims this, it only means that we who want true poems must all be born again and die to do so. So the poet does want to write and the poet, poetry's audience can be all of us, but the route to these true poems take us to existential questions, and we must all be willing to grapple with the meaning of rebirth and death in order to write and receive them. They say I'm a poet, write for them. Sometimes I laugh, uh, sometimes I solemnly nod. I do not want to look them in the eye lest they should squeal and scamper far away. A poet cannot write for those who ask, hardly himself even, except he lies. Poems are written either for the dying or for the unborn, no matter what we say. 
That does not mean his audience lies remote inside a womb or some cold bed of agony. It only means that we who want true poems must all be born again and die to do so. Extracts from Martin Carter's diary published in the 2000 Kaiko overall. 22nd of October, 1963. Publishing poetry in this country is like lending books to corpses. Few read, and those who do are not equipped either by curiosity or sensibility to understand what is confronting them. 28th of October, 1963. I say that to be a writer is to have a profession. To be a poet is to have a way of life. What now is the poet's way of life? I think it consists of always continuously making use of the raw material of experience to sponsor the essential human truth. But what is human truth? That which is perceived in dialectical instant? That stage is a process when time is abolished and birth or rebirth can take place. Thus the way of life of a poet is always to be ready, always prepared to be available at and for a dialectical instant. Here, of course, since all experience is subjective, Dialectical instances occur privately. Further, at a dialectical instant, there must occur a leap from becoming this state of being consisting of what I call the dialectical instant. Thus, from becoming to being to becoming ad infinitum. Although the poems are not presented as a narrative, they are understandable as a sequence, articulated by one voice and each analysing different aspects of disappointment in the present world. In the second poem, Carter confronts the problems of articulation in what he calls this world. He says, I dare not keep too silent, face averted. That tells too much, it gives the heart away. In this poem, silence would perhaps be the poet's honest, maybe most honourable response to this world. It is not clear if silence would also be the most effective protest. Certainly, silence is expressed as the most personally dangerous to the poet. Silence is too personal, too revealing. Carter writes, quick words distract attention from the eyes. And this survivalist position questions his moral refusal in the first poem to write according to public demand. Quick words, those self-preserving but duplicitous words, are the opposite of a poet's words, words which should be just and truthful. I dare not keep you silent, face averted. That tells too much. It gives the heart away. Quick words distract attention from the eyes and smiling lips are most acceptable. In any case, it's not good to show the nature of the silence of the heart. To talk is just as easy as to walk, and laughter can be one of a thousand kinds. I must be casual even over death. This fools the fool whose triumph is a coffin. Shallow's grave pit is the mock concern which murders men as surely as a knife. To cherish silence in the memory is to be full of utter loneliness. It must be right unborn with such a curse to laugh and talk and drink like any boor. An extract from Where Are the Heroes, published in Thunder on November 26, 1955. Subsisting on a diet of Hollywood films, True detective magazines and other such trash. Bounded on one side by the sugar estates, 
and on the other by the waterfront. The people of the city are like creatures in a cage, pressed down into the mud under the weight of a hopeless sky. The people live like ants in an ant's nest, biting at each other because there's nothing else for them to bite at. And when a voice emerges out of all of this muck, oh, the little lap dogs bark in furious excitement, defending the master, who from time to time will administer a well-aimed kick for remembrance. The third poem registers the noisiness of his world. And for someone with Carter's revolutionary politics, there is such a weight attached to the line, the loud men who cry freedom and are so full of lies. In this poetic world, it is the voices of wild men, loud men and drunk men that provide a suffocating soundscape rather than companions for conversation. The wild men in prison was they who rot like rust. The loud men who cry freedom and are so full of lies. The drunk men who go dancing like shadows down the street. These all surround me, shouting to God for help. I really do not see how God can help them. But each one wants the same thing. Who can share to prisoners, politicians, and drunk men what only souls that blaze and burn can win? In the fourth poem, Carter addresses the failure to create true poems. He writes, trying with words to purify disgust, I made a line I simply can't remember. This notion of poetry as purification is clarified when Carter chooses the words that should have made up this now forgotten line. He writes, nouns and verbs like truth and love and hope and happiness. Carter registers his sustained commitment to these words and the emotions and the conditions that they signify. But tellingly, he cannot write these words unselfconsciously. In acknowledging his own poetic failures, the poetic voice holds in tension his poetic hope for purification, truth and happiness on the one hand, and on the other, his sense that poetic honesty will dictate poems about impurity, disgust and unhappiness. Trying with words to purify disgust, I made a line I simply can't remember. For hours now, I've poked through memory, a desperate child in a jam-packed garbage can. It should have been a line with nouns and verbs like truth and love and hope and happiness. But looking round, it seems I was mistaken to substitute a temple for a shop. To see a shop and dream of holy temples is to expect a toad to sing a song. And yet, who knows, someone may turn translator when all these biped reptiles crawl again. Diary entry 28th of October 1963. My mental agony and spiritual distress. What a horror has life become. And what makes it bluntly unendurable is the clarity, the nakedness with which I see everything. For a people like us, marooned in misery and with naked roots, everything must be raw material awaiting transformation. The drunk man, dazed in a gutter, the criminal, damned in a cell, the priest, happy in his celibacy, 
the merchant, hypnotized with profit, the politician, blind with power, the mother, paralyzed with her child's end, the lover, ecstatic with freedom. We must accept all of these as those who constitute the stuff of an experience. The natural order, the given universe out of which we must create what we want. The fifth poem offers us almost a mini ballad, but it is not a conversation. Instead, it is the reported monologue of the murderer telling a partial tale. Carter makes the murderer an unreliable narrator here, whose story will remain forever untold, but whose refrain will be constantly repeated to all and no one. All gone, all is gone, all gone, the murderer cried. Now there was one whom I knew long ago, and then another to whom I paid respect. The first I would salute, the second prayers. All is gone, all gone, the murderer cried. Along what roads they went, he cannot say. So many roads there are, so many bends. There is no shortcut to integrity. All, all is gone, all gone, the murderer cried. They did not mean to kill, only burn. But then one act can transform everything. A brother into charcoal, love to crime. Yes, all is gone. All gone, the murderer cried. In the sixth poem, Carter offers a Kafkaesque version of conversation in which the poet and those speaking with him metamorphose. If the prisoners, politicians, drunk men and murderers of the earlier poems seem noisy but not capable of conversation, the articulation of any human words becomes impossible in this new poem. He writes, groaning in this wilderness of silence, where voices hardly human shout at me, I imitate the most obscure of insects. And he ends the poem, I nodded and agreed and listened close, but when I tried to utter words, I barked. In 1954, Carter wrote an article for Thunder called An American Oracle in which he observes, every few weeks or so, some official or expert or advisor arrives in British Guyana and after spending a few days in the company of assorted reactionaries, completes the visit by making oracular disquisitions, either about the Soviet Union or, quote unquote, the communist conspiracy to rule the world. All very much in the manner of the character Shakespeare parodied by crediting with the lines, I am Sir Oracle, when I open my mouth, let no dogs bark. The American oracle that Carter refers to was a man called Mr. L. E. Norrie, the public affairs officer of the US Information Service, who visited Guyana for four days in 1954. The brevity of Norrie's visit is telling, and Carter dissects the hollow noise of his oracular disquisition. The words Carter quotes in the article is part of a longer speech in The Merchant of Venice, dominated by a debate about the appropriateness of speaking, when to do it, when not to, what to say and what to withhold. If Mr Norrie is a foolish Sir Oracle who says nothing but professes the truth, then Carter's interest in The Merchant of Venice helps him to think about the power of conversation or silence over speech. Carter's poems range from the poet who refuses to write, to the poet who dare not keep too silent, to the poet who is forced into silence, to the poet who writes about silence. In 1961, Carter had not lapsed uncritically into silence, but wished to invoke the critical use of conversation and silence that Shakespeare explores in the opening scene of The Merchant of Venice. The barking voice of the poet in this penultimate poem in Conversations then holds a number of implications. 
the poet can be protesting, that is, his bark can be read as a paradoxically articulate response to the oracle surrounding him. However, the poet could also be a Sir oracle, a false prophet uttering quick words, barking but saying nothing. Groaning in this wilderness of silence, where voices hardly human shout at me, I imitate the most obscure of insects and burrow in the soil and hide from light. Speaking with one on a pavement in the city, I watched the greedy mouth, the cunning eye. I reeled and nearly fell in frantic terror, seeing a human turn into a dog. Recovering, I studied this illusion and made a stupid effort to be strong. I nodded and agreed and listened close. But when I tried to utter words, I barked. In a great silence, I hear approaching rain. There is a sound of conflict in the sky. The frightened lizard darts behind a stone. First was the wind. Now is the wild assault. I wish this world would sink and drown again so that we build another Noah's Ark and send another little dove to find what we have lost in the floods of misery. Artist as Artist, a letter in Kai Koverall in 1958. The job of the artist, an intellectual in the West Indies, is not different from the job of the artist, an intellectual in every part of the world. We are concerned always with the human condition and the establishment of value. Everything is to be taken in the hand and transformed and given meaning. In the first poem of Conversations, Carter reveals a faith in the future of poetry and says that it, re it lies in our reckoning of rebirth and death. And in many ways, the poem registers Carter's interest in holding together apparently contradictory states. We might say that Carter's true poems are those which seek to open up or expand the ways in which we view the world. And they also seek to close down or encompass the world through truthful definitions of its present state. This contradictory desire to open up and close down the world in which we live helps us to think about Carter's poetry in conversations. The final poem with its explicit flood imagery, I wish the world would sink and drown again so that we build another Noah's Ark, forms a most pronounced articulation of that desire and the optimism and pessimism that's associated with it. We have the torment of the wild assault, but we also have the immense power of the poem's final wish to send another little dove to find what we have lost in floods of misery. I mentioned at the start that Carter's is a poetry of involvement and conversation can be folded into this idea. This week I had the good fortune to speak to the Nigerian poet Ni Oshindare about his great respect and love for the work of Martin Carter. And he has written about Carter's work, finding it in Nigeria in the late 1970s at a time when his country was, he says, reeling in the maelstrom of post-independence disillusionment. He goes on to say this, it was the poetry of Martin Carter that provided the most immediate, most direct song for the barricades. University of Hunger and many of his others passed from hand to hand and lip to lip. These poems were so lyrical, so relevant, that many of us began to wonder why we hadn't known their author much earlier. This powerful 
image of work being passed from hand to hand and lip to lip is an image of poetry's power of connection and conversation, the power to help us to talk, to live together, to think together. And I hope it is an image that you will hold on to this evening as we remember Martin Carter. Thank you. <laughs>